And welcome into another episode of the Outsider Sports Hockey Podcast. I'm Ben Mandel, joined by Mikey D and Tom Leone, as we have playoff hockey to discuss. Now, we are recording this as usual on Wednesday night. Now, sorry guys, we are not going to be able to hold out until the end of all of the games today. We are about a period into both of the Nightcap Western Conference games. So the Bruins and Panthers are in the books, as well as the Islanders and Hurricanes for Game 2 over there. We see Edmonton currently leading Los Angeles and uh, the Dallas Stars and Minnesota Wild. They're squaring up head-to-head right now as well. So... We'll still have to see how those games make out, but plenty to discuss over the first games for a few of them over here, the ones that will get Game 2 going on Thursday night, tonight, and then the uh, ones that have Game 2 going tonight, and that is Wednesday night. So, guys, we're going to get right into it, and let's talk about the Bruins and Panthers because the Florida Panthers, a huge, huge 6-3 6-3 to three win. Tom, what is your takeaway so far from the first two games in that Florida-Boston series? That they're the better team so far. I think they should have won game one, and they decisively won game two. They're, they have the depth that could beat Boston, and their big hex factor will be what goalie shows up. You know, they fell behind early in game one because Lyon gave up some soft goals. Tonight, he didn't allow that to happen. And Florida is showing their speed, their depth, their size. They can play with this Boston team. And it was to your point, Ben, that you said when we were recording these pods weeks back that that's the team that that you would like to see Boston play because you think they could give them the best fight. And it's happening. I Like I said before, I think they should have won game one. And they deserved game two because they they came out and played the same exact way. And the result wasn't there in the first game, but game two sure was. And Brandon Montour took over that game. Some beautiful shots from the point. And it's exciting stuff. I think going back home, they flipped home ice. Could get interesting and it could get dicey for Boston, especially with some injuries they're dealing with. So I'm excited to see where that series goes. But uh, uh, Florida, very impressive. Yeah, worth noting that Patrice Bergeron uh, has been out with an illness. So you think maybe he'll be back for game three. Who knows? If you're Boston, you hope so, because one of the biggest things, especially in game two, were the face-offs, and that is where they've missed Bergeron the most, you can argue. It's in the face-off circle, and, you know, Boston, they won one of these games without Bergeron. That Yeah, I think they were outplayed in game one as well, but Boston, they look like they're just trying to weather the storm in that first game, and they capitalize on their opportunities. What I saw in game two was Florida made Boston look uncomfortable, and they made Boston turn the puck over a significant amount of times, and that's why they were able to score those four goals in the third period. So really just a strong, strong showing, I think, from the Panthers, especially in game two, because while in game one, it looked like they may have been the better team, Boston was the more dominant team by far. Mikey, D, what are your thoughts on this Boston Florida series so far? I think it just shows them, um, you know, uh, you know, how we talked about all year and, you know, on this podcast, everything like that, like Boston, despite, you know, how slow and, you know, even when they are lacking, they can still find a way to pull out games because that's exactly what happened in game one. Now, obviously, game two is a whole different story. I think Florida, um, you know, showed the potential that they had in game one. They made less mistakes. They capitalized on, on Boston being slow. Um, so that's why we got an even series right now. And I just think it is a, you know, it's a great matchup, you know, a lot of talent on both sides. And at the same time, you know, it's a, you know, it's, it just proves that Boston's going to always find a way to stick around. And, and despite how, you know, slow they play, despite how lack, lackluster they, they play, um, you know, that makes them a threat always, you know, cause they're always going to show up and, and, um, and, and be a factor in some way, even when they're not playing their best hockey. And that's what makes them so dangerous. Um, and I just think that Florida needs to keep the, the foot on the pedal. You know, they, they can't stop and, um, they gotta, they gotta keep pushing how Boston like they did tonight. And, uh, and if that's the case, then we're going to have a really good series. I could definitely see it going into seven. I know most of us had him going in five. Um, can see the series going to six or seven and Florida continues to play the way that they've been playing. Yeah, definitely a strong showing from Florida in these first two games. And the big thing is they've knotted up the series, flipped home ice, and they've instilled confidence not only in themselves, but really just in general. There's a little bit of doubt in Boston, not necessarily in that locker room. I don't think so yet. That's a veteran group with a strong, tough-minded coach in Jim Montgomery. 
I'm not worried about the Bruins. By no means are we saying that the Florida Panthers are going to turn around and win this series. They very well could, but it is definitely still up in the air. We're just seeing that Boston's not going to walk into a Stanley Cup final. So we shift over to the other series in the Atlantic Division bracket. That's the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Tampa Bay Lightning. And boy, oh boy, did we see playoff Toronto in this one. My biggest takeaway is Ilya Samsonov is what I've been saying in the postseason. This is not a playoff goaltender. They need someone else in net. Ray Matt Murray has figured out the glove. Mikey D, we'll let you kick it off here. What are your thoughts on Toronto and Tampa Bay after that game one thrashing Toronto took from Tampa? It just doesn't surprise me at the same time. It's crazy because, you know, I, we, we come on here, we finally say like, oh, it's, you know, Toronto's going to show up. It's going to be their year, everything like that. You know, the weakness in goaltending, like you just stated, it is clearly showing. Um, and Tampa is just showing that veteran status and showing they deserve to be in, you know, in the conversation as always has they, have they been like the last five, six years. I think Toronto's going to get it together. Obviously, you know, they, uh, you know, they will find a way to turn around. They'll make the adjustments and everything. But at the same time, you know, Tampa's just proven that uh, uh, don't count them out despite the year that they had. Don't count them out. It's going to be a very fun series. Yeah, I, I, I have to tend to agree with Mike on a lot, a lot of what he said. I was the one that was really honing in on the fact that the Maple Leafs might have better goaltending than they did the last couple of playoff series. And I was just basing that solely on giving Sam Sonoff the benefit of the doubt, looking at his stats for the regular season. He posted almost, a, you know, uh, a 92% uh, clip in a, in the save percentage. I think he was just below maybe 0.916 or something or along those lines. I'm like, you know what? I feel like every time I looked at a Toronto goalie the last five years, they'd hover in like the low, you know, low 900s uh, when it came to save, save percentage. And I, I just thought that the team would have it figured out and it couldn't have started worse for them. But I still am confident they'll win the series. I think that might have been, you know, the one alarming thing is they kind of known the game has been coming for months, right? It's kind of been known that it's going to be Toronto, Tampa Bay because of what Boston was doing. And game one, you get thrashed like that. Of course, it's a little concerning, but also I think, you know, they dominated Tampa Bay last year in game one and they lost that series. So hockey and the playoffs, it's a weird thing. Game one of round one is like judging a football team in week one of the NFL season. It doesn't tell the whole story. It doesn't show the whole picture. And yes, it was bad for Toronto and it could get really bad, but I got to give them at least until game two to really worry. I still think they win the series. Yeah, Toronto, home ice to bounce back for game two. I think when you lose big time on home ice in game one, you see a good response in game two generally, especially from a team with the amount of veterans that Toronto has. Now, it's really interesting when you look at what happened on Tuesday night. Every single team that was at home lost, and every single game but one of them was a four-goal margin. Winnipeg defeated the Vegas Golden Knights 5-1 to one on the road. Tampa Bay on the road defeated Toronto 7-3. to three. The Rangers went on the road into Newark and defeated the Devils 5-1. to one. And then it was the Seattle Kraken who went on the road into Colorado. They didn't win by four, but they won by two, 3-1. to one. Only one goal from Colorado in that high-octane offense. We talked about goaltending being the issue. In that game, it clearly wasn't. Seattle had 30 shots on goal and only three goals to show for it. So really just an interesting way that that played out. Before we jump into any of those series, though, let's talk about the two series that are going on right now, Edmonton and Los Angeles. At the time of recording this, the second period has just dropped the puck. Edmonton leads it 2 nothing in this game. Edmonton also led 2 nothing after the first period in game number one. They wound up losing that game 4-3 to in overtime. Tom, you kick us off here. What are your thoughts so far on Edmonton? Because they've looked dominant, but somehow aren't leading this series. Yeah, it was almost uh, reminiscent of the Kings playoff runs from early 2010s. I was very surprised they blew that lead on Tuesday, uh, uh, Monday night, uh, excuse me. And I think they are going to put it together. They'll finish this one off as we're recording, and I think they'll get on a little roll. I did say in our playoff preview podcast that 
LA was originally my dark horse. You know, if I stuck with that narrative, Monday would have really felt my favor. But just watching the game and then watching the first period tonight, uh, you know, Wednesday night here, uh, Edmonton's the better team. They're going to outlast them in a seven-game series, and I'm confident in that. All credit to LA and Anze Kopitar. Kopitar had like a legacy game. He channeled his his early career, Anze Kopitar, and, and, and willed. LA to victory on uh, Monday night, but that's not going to last. I think Edmonton take care of business tonight. And I think they go into LA and take at least one. And then once you do that, you flip home ice in your favor again. And, and, and I like their chances. Yeah. I mean, right now, as it stands 18 minutes left in the second period, the shot totals 14 to three in favor of Edmonton. They are flat out dominating once again at home. They should be able to take care of business, but who knows? LA's a feisty team, and they're the kind of team that just needs to hang around. Now, Mikey D, over to you. What are your thoughts so far on Edmonton and Los Angeles? Yeah, well, I'm the. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I know Tom says uh, he had LA as a dark horse. I'm pretty sure I picked LA to actually win this series. So, um, you know, that's just you know that's just the thing about LA. Like you said, they're they're very gritty, and if they hang around, that we'll find a way to make games competitive and stick in them, and obviously find ways to win them like they did the other night. Um, you know, as for tonight, um, I feel like it's the same thing for the last game. You know, they they start off slow, um, and I think that's going to catch up to them in a, in a negative way. Um, you can't just keep hanging around against this team, you know, this Edmonton team. Like, they're so talented. You know, Jai Salah McDavid and all the weapons that they have, you can't just let them, you know, have a lead because coming back each time is going to take a big toll on the team and, and, and them and them as players. So, um, you know, I, I do – I obviously, I still think L.A. has a really good chance of winning this series if they just find a way to continue to being gritty and sticking around in games and obviously making them competitive because that takes a toll on Edmonton as well. Um, but at the same time, if, uh, you know, if they're always going to be playing from behind, I think it's going to take more of a toll on them. And I think the, you know, the feeling and obviously the, uh, it's a little more lean towards Edmonton to win this series. So, um, I still, I think I'm very on the fence with this one. I think it's, you know, it can go either way in my opinion. Uh, but Edmonton is, is, is clearly showing what, uh, you know, how dominant they really are and, and deserving to be. Yeah, it's really just been dominance from Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl, especially Leon Dreisaitl. He has stepped his game up to another level that I didn't even know he had. He has looked like the best player on the ice out there right now, and that is including Connor McDavid. Now let's swing over Dallas, Minnesota. Dallas ends up losing game one in overtime, double overtime. And this game right Min- now is nuts. The one it is on right insane. Now. It is currently four to three Dallas. It's but six that's three. been going back. Dallas. No, oh, I've got. <laughs> I'm not. I don't have it on. So, they, so they, that's two goals from Dallas right there. I'll just read it off right now before you before you continue. Uh, Minnesota scored to make it four two at eleven fifty four. Made it four three at twelve oh five. Four minutes passed. Dallas made it five three at sixteen oh eight, and then six three at sixteen fifty six. The Donoff has nuts. two goals and Hintz has two goals. So they're both on hat trick watching game two of the and playoffs. That's this is the West, right? This is what we were talking about. Now, not, this isn't exactly the series that I thought was going to open things up. But whoa, boy, oh boy, is are things opening up for the Dallas Stars as this is a team with a ton of offense while Minnesota's good defensively. This is a tough matchup for them. And I don't know, this is just an exciting series. Minnesota, a lot like Los Angeles, they're able to hang around and fight for wins and grind out wins. Mikey D, we'll let you kick this one off. What are your thoughts on Minnesota and Dallas? You know, you also consider Minnesota as another dark horse. You know, it's 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 crazy because obviously I have a big, uh, you know, a uh, big heart for Dallas. You know, over the last few weeks, you know, ending the regular season, I obviously had Dallas as you know the one team that felt disrespected in our top ten rankings, everything like that. Um, but you know, Minnesota is very talented too, right? I mean, they have all the weapons and they've been showing it. Uh, they they pulled out an awesome win, um, you know, the other night. Um, you know, right now this game, I think you definitely could see the series going back and forth. Um, you know, definitely coming down to the wire because you know both these teams are so talented on the offensive level um and uh you could definitely see you know fireworks of goals on both sides so i think dallas obviously found their rhythm you know which they didn't find the other night um but like i said when it switches uh when it switches ice i think minnesota is going to find their stride again too um you know i'm just very intrigued i'm like obviously i still have dallas winning the series but um i definitely think that minnesota is going to give them a run um but i think dallas is the better team um it's just about who gets high at the right time you know with these two teams 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Tom, over to you. What are your thoughts on Minnesota and Dallas? I know you took Minnesota to win this series, but Dallas has been the trendy pick. What are your thoughts on Minnesota so far? I did take Minnesota because I was not expecting Dallas to be able to do what they're doing to them tonight. And that scares me a little bit because I've said this multiple times down the pod, a, a playoff series will mimic a regular season and eat. And, and sometimes it only works for that way for one team where, where one team will be more consistent and the better team, the team with more talent will plan to play that inconsistency or follow their trends of the regular season. So for Dallas, in my mind, when they got going, they'd have stretches of games where they'd score a ton of goals. And that's what scares me. They could probably, you know, they've already put six past flurry in game two, game three, they can put another four or five. It doesn't matter who they're playing because when those guys start clicking, that's how it is for them. And that's scary. And my eyes have opened up to that possibility. I loved Minnesota's game in game one. I said, if they could play that consistently, they're going to win this series. Dallas, though, has responded and responded big. And now I'm starting to remember when I would just kind of gauge at games from the West Coast and even bet them how there'd be streaks where I could just pick one of Robertson, Hintz, Pavelski and Sagan and I knew for four or five straight nights one of those guys was scoring or all of them were scoring because they just got on a on, on a roll and that's what is would scare me if I'm a Minnesota fan because when those guys get going they don't stop for a couple of games and they could just win this one big in a route and and then take the next three honestly that's how good Dallas can be I'm still going to hold out hope though that Minnesota can channel when they go back home that game one performance and and, and squeak out a win in the series but but to your point earlier, I was not expecting it any of these games to be high scoring like this, and they are. So this is really going to shape up to a good series. Yeah, definitely a lot of good stuff. And I said heading into this postseason that I think Dallas is the most complete team out of those three in the Central. They have the offense, they have some good defensemen, and they have the best goalie in the Central outside of Connor Hellebuck. So I, I think they are the most complete team out of the Central. Now, over to the other series in the central bracket, the Colorado Avalanche and the Seattle Kraken. The Seattle Kraken, first ever playoff game, they have to go on the road and play the defending champs in their first playoff game of the Stanley Cup defense, and they take a 3-1 to one win. Now, Colorado played well, but what do you guys have to think about Seattle's performance here? Tom, over to you. How do you feel about Seattle not only being able to win, but holding them to just one goal when goaltending and defense seems to be their biggest weakness. Biggest upset of, of game ones, without a doubt, uh, because of the point you just made, Ben. If they would have won that game 6-5, I would have been like, okay, you know what, that's probably how they're going to win these these games in this series if they do win you know, multiple games. But that was just impressive. That was that was a group of veterans, some with playoff experience, some with not, with a mixture of some young guys like Veneers, just playing free, playing their system, and playing solid hockey to the point where they have now injected themselves with the sense of confidence that we can beat these guys, we can beat the defending champs. I don't know what that will turn into because – it's game one, no matter what happens, you can't overact either way. You could just call a spade a spade from that game specifically. I'm going to call it the biggest upset of game ones, but I'm not going to expect Seattle to duplicate that performance or Seattle to win the series now because they were able to contain Colorado for one game. It happens all the time. You can't overreact to game ones. Seattle, kudos to you. One more time, I'll say biggest upset of the game ones that we've seen and are talking about tonight but I don't expect that to continue, and I expect Colorado to start rolling and take care of this series pretty early. It's definitely a surprise, but I did feel like Seattle was going to win a couple of games, and they were going to have that kind of first playoff game energy. Now, I thought they were going to bring that type of game to game one at home for them, so game three in the series, but for them to show it in game one there is big. Whatever happens in game two happens. Now you come back to home ice and take care of business. All of a sudden, you've got a shot. My biggest takeaway from this is that Colorado needs to figure it out. They don't have time to just sit back and kind of try to get your legs underneath them and try to get healthier again. 
you know, you've got to go. This is a team that's going to go out there and score goals. You're not going to hold them to three goals usually. And, you know, for Colorado's sake, they got 35 shots on goal in this game. They've just got to be able to finish, and that's going to come. So I'm not worried about it for Colorado, but at the same time, I think they need to show a little bit more urgency than what we saw in game number one. Mikey D, over to you. What are your thoughts on Colorado-Seattle? Yeah, I know when we did our uh, playoff previews and everything like that, I literally said that this was going to be the series, that there was going to be fireworks, right? You know, so much talent on both sides, so many goals. And and a man was uh, wrong for that game one. But like, you know, like Tom said, you can't really overreact game once. I mean, until we talk about the other series, uh, which we will get into. But uh, at the same time, I just think, you know, you said it best, Ben. I think they were disconnected, you know, Colorado. I mean, they're the champs. You know, you can't count them out after one game and everything like that. I think they're going to figure it out. But, um, you know, at the end of the game, I'm pretty sure they outshot them like 35 to 30. It was pretty close to the same point, but McKinnon even came out in an interview afterwards and he said that they he felt disconnected, like the team felt disconnected. So they even know that they didn't they didn't play their best hockey. They played sloppy. Um and obviously in and uh and the Kraken this new team, you know, they were just living in the moment. They played freely. Um they played the system well, like Tom said, and and they got the, the biggest win in their franchise history, obviously, um, you know, coming up from the other night. So um I think Colorado would definitely figure it out. Uh but good for Seattle though, because they are proving that they can hang with the with the big guys. So um I think it will definitely make an interesting series if they can ride the momentum um into their first very um home playoff game too. It'd be very cool to see. Yeah, definitely, definitely exciting things with Seattle. And as frustrated as I was with how good Vegas was in their first year, I felt like it was unfair. It's nice to see these expansion teams succeeding because it is good for the league and it is exciting to see new teams and new fan bases get to grow like this. Now let's shift over. Last series, only series we haven't touched on yet in the West. That's the Vegas Golden Knights and the Winnipeg Jets. The Winnipeg Jets absolutely stunned Vegas, who had Mark Stone back for this game and for the playoffs. And they put they put up five on them. They win five to one. Guys, oof, oof, big game for Winnipeg. Mikey D, what are your thoughts so far? on what we saw in game one over there in Vegas. Just wow, right? Uh, you know, it's funny because you sent us, you know, a text, you know, right before the game started. You know, Mark Stone is back. You know, he is the biggest, you know, missing piece that Vegas had, you know, to make them even more complete team than they already are. You know, obviously the atmosphere in Vegas is nuts as it is, you know, a home playoff game and everything like that. And Winnipeg just went in there and absolutely punched him in the mouth. You know, it is, um, you know, it doesn't shock me to to uh, to an extent because we know how talented Winnipeg is. Um, you know, they have so so many, uh, you know, so many talented uh, goal scorers in their team. Um, you know, defensively, I just didn't think that they would, you know, hold up Vegas as much as they did. Um, and especially a goaltending matchup too. I thought that um, the Vegas, you know, had the advantage as well. But you know, Winnipeg came in there, they they showed up, and they said, you know, you know, we're here to play uh, a series, and and they uh, they definitely showed up. I'm very excited um, to see how this series ends up too, because um, you know, I don't, I think Vegas will figure it out. Obviously, can't overreact to Game One, like I said multiple times, but other series now. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I think Winnipeg's going to put up a good fight and that potentially, you know, could win this series, you know, if they continue to play like they did. Yeah. And Tom, you said before that the Seattle Colorado game was the biggest upset of the game ones. I actually think it's this one. I think Winnipeg was definitely more of a surprise. I understand they have Connor Hellebuck, but I just feel like, especially with Mark Stone coming back, that. Vegas losing game one there. The fact that they were able to hold on to the Pacific and the top seed in the West, I just felt like there was going to be more from them. And I don't know, maybe is Bruce Cassidy just not a good playoff coach? That might be something to think about. Obviously, that's a game one overreaction. But who knows if that's a trend that continues and Vegas is not able to have success here. Uh, who knows those questions could arise because he had a lot of good teams in Boston and you see what they're doing as soon as he left but before we even get down that rabbit hole Tom over to you because what are your thoughts on this series my thoughts haven't really changed on how I think the outcome is gonna go I think game one Vegas was complacent I think Winnipeg came out hungrier quicker faster we're winning all the 50-50 battles. And I think Vegas was just, whoa, okay, was not expecting that. And I think they'll be ready game two. I think, to your point, with Cassidy, maybe he just didn't have his locker room ready. Maybe he didn't 
emphasize how important it a game one was. And and I get the that the professional hockey players they don't need that. But you know, Vegas has been coasting kind of all year, hovering around the top spot. You get to a game one, you're playing a Winnipeg team that kind of limped at the finish. They, you know, they snuck in. They were a lot better earlier in the year. They their stars are kind of aging. Minus Kyle Connor, Pierre Luc Dubois didn't really have the year that he was that he was projected to have, and you got your teeth kicked in. I think it was a wake a wake up call for them. I think they're going to bounce back and be fine. Kudos to Winnipeg, but once again, you're not going to get me to overreact to anything on either end of a game one. Great game for for Winnipeg. Dominated pretty much every stat you could want except hits and face off percentage. And that those were even close. So that's a way to win a game one and send a statement. And once again, a road team flips home ice in their favor. If you take care of your home games, they win the series now. So kudos to them, but I expect Vegas to bounce back. Yeah, definitely think that Vegas can and will bounce back. We're going to shift back over to the East, though, now and talk about the Carolina Hurricanes and the New York Islanders because the Carolina Hurricanes took a 2 nothing series lead today. But boy, oh boy, if I'm a New York Islander fan or a player from the New York Islanders, I don't know how I necessarily feel about this because I you feel like from for the final 30 minutes in the second game, you could feel really good about the way the Islanders played. And they should have won this game, arguably based off of that. But they didn't. It goes to overtime and a win for Carolina on Jesper Fott's overtime winner. But six penalties called on the Islanders, zero on the Carolina Hurricanes. And it's not like we didn't see some blatant missed calls on Carolina's end. So, guys, what are your thoughts here? Tom, we'll go to you first because I know you're the Islander hater. So if you have anything to point out there, it's definitely going to legitimize it. I would be furious if I was an Islander fan, and I I will go on record saying they're going to win both games at UBS. You watch a Carolina series, you know. I mean, the last couple of years they they can't they're not they're playing the same as they played the the series last year. They're they're almost identical. They're playing tight games at home, where basically just getting Jordan Stahl out there against their number one unit and and, and Brendan Moore being able to match the last change is is preventing them from falling behind in games. And their special teams are winning games, and then they get lucky at home and they get calls in their favor. Maybe the crowds are influenced influencing the refs I don't know but that's absurd that somehow some way one hockey team had six infractions and another team went clean like there's just no way that's possible especially with the Islanders basically dominating to your point the last 30 minutes of the game so clearly Carolina was on their heels and yet took no penalties it doesn't make any sense I'm confident they're going to use this one and that the Islanders are going to make a comeback in the series I don't know if they'll win it but they're going to win both games at UBS and it should be interesting Yeah, I am very, very confident that the Islanders are going to absolutely demolish Carolina in Game 3, and it's because we know Carolina. It's not going to be the same Carolina team on the road. Until they prove to me otherwise, I don't think Carolina can win on the road. Now, it's important they do have home ice. So for the Islanders, yeah, they lost the first two games, but you don't have to win a game on the road until Game 5, So you're or Game 7. So you're okay. Games 1 and 2... It's okay if you lose them, but game three is when you have to lock things down and win. Mike E.D., real quick, over to you. What are your thoughts on the Hurricanes and Islanders so far? Yeah, quickly. Obviously, you know, if I'm an Islander fan, I'd be very upset too. I mean, the way that the game was called today and, and everything like that, you know, it just, uh, you know, it takes the momentum out of it and it kind of feels like you lost one and it, it was stolen from you. Um, but, you know, at the same time, if, if there's one series and one team that I'd be less worried about being down 2 0, I think it would be the Islanders team against this Canes team. Uh, once the, once the ice switches, um, I think that the Islanders in that, in, in that stadium, they're going to, you know, they're going to turn things around and they're going to tie this series up before they have to go back to Carolina. Um, you know, I just like you said, Ben, I can't, be convinced that Carolina could win a road game in the playoffs. And I think they're going to play very differently. The games have been close as it is. Um, so give me the Islanders to tie the series up. And uh, I could definitely see, you know, the series going down to the wire because it's going to be who's at home and who's going to win these games. Yeah, exactly. So now last series to talk about, we saved it for last because we know it's the one we have the most to say about. But we're going to try to keep it brief because it is just one game. We don't want to overreact. I'm going to start us off, guys. First of all, 
got to tip your cap to the New York Rangers and Gerard Gallant because he had this team very, very well prepared, and he was not taking the New Jersey Devils lightly. The Rangers did not allow the Devils any shooting lanes or passing lanes, and you can see their inexperience show. They tried to be way too perfect. If they saw Shesterkin and there was no traffic in front of him, they were not taking the shot. They felt like they needed a perfect opportunity to shoot, and ultimately it let Igor settle into this game very early on, and then he made some terrific saves throughout. Now, for the devil's sake, You just got to play your game. You cannot come into the playoffs and switch things up and try to be too cute and too perfect because that's what happened. When you have zero shots on the power play, I know the Rangers blocked a bunch and the Devils missed the net a bunch, but just put pucks on net. You have to find a way to get pucks on net. That's what they do best against the Rangers and Igor Shesterkin throughout the regular season this year and the past year. It's what they have to continue doing. Now, Mikey D, I know you are not going to be as positive as I necessarily feel because, again, I don't think the sky is falling. I think the Devils can bounce back. I'm not worried. I think they'll have a response a lot like I think Toronto will. But, Tom, over to you. What are your thoughts on your Rangers in that Game 1 dominant performance? They were aggressive by being passive, if that makes sense. Uh, I noticed something. I went back and watched the last Ranger Devil game, and then I watched the playoff game. And I'll keep this brief. A lot of the times, I saw the Rangers playing a tight point. Their defensemen were very engaged. This game, game one, the defense was near center ice. Any time a forward lost the puck, they were not letting the Devils break out. And the biggest thing was they just let the forwards do the forechecking. There was very little pinching unless they they felt they had an opportunity to fox the Lindgren the play where Tarasenko got a goal and there was a pinch on the left side. Um, they, they weren't doing it all the time. In that game, that game where the Devils were just flying around the Rangers, the Rangers got caught in their heels because they were being too aggressive with their D-men. The D-men were getting caught too much. Forwards were having to back check. They were getting spun around. They were out of position. To your point, the passing lanes were blocked. The shooting lanes were blocked. The Rangers played a game plan that they needed to stick to because – it clearly rattled the Devils to a point. I know the Devils didn't play their game, but it rattled them, and and it showed the Rangers and their team a way to not only beat the Devils, but control them, contain them, and the, and the Rangers control the pace of a game against a team that is clearly faster than them. They control the pace. That's the only takeaway I'm really happy about, and obviously the known fact that teams that win game one of a series win the series 68% of the time and a road team that wins the first game wins it 76% of the time because they flip home ice. Devils are a great road team. I expect a response from them too. I'm not overreacting to the point where I think the Rangers are now going to win the series in four or five, but now I am very confident that I know the Rangers can keep up with this Devils team. If they need to, they can shut them down. And that's why I really feel like the series is going six or seven, no matter what. And if the Rangers come on top, it is what it is, but It was a great game one, and it was a great start to the series. Yeah, Tom, I think that's what's most alarming as a Devils fan is that the Rangers were able to control the pace, and the Devils, it's not like they didn't show up. They showed up. They had the energy. They just, they were rattled off their game. They weren't on their game because the Rangers knocked them out of it. Now, Mikey D, over to you. I'll let Doomsday begin. (laughs) I just don't feel they're ready after watching that. I had to, uh, I, I know you could disagree with me and that's fine. Both of you in, in an extent, that's totally fine. I, um, I had the privilege to, to be there, uh, the other night and, uh, and, you know, it was, uh, you know, I had uh, almost tears in my eyes of happiness, you know, seeing the introduction, finally going to my first ever playoff game. Obviously, I don't get to see this very often. Um, and, it, and it was a great experience until the puck dropped. Um, you know, the whole game from start to finish, I just felt the the Devils were not ready. You, they, they did not belong in the same ice at all as the Rangers. Um, they just were doing the little things wrong. They couldn't pass the puck. They couldn't, they couldn't uh, caress the puck. They couldn't do anything right. It was, it was... Um, I know it's game one. I get it. You know, a lot of them are young. A lot of them have no playoff experience, but you could definitely tell that experience was the biggest factor in this game. And, uh, you know, I, I generally believe you guys are professionals. You can't let nervousness and roundness affect you in, in a series, especially as big as this one. Um, obviously, you know, 
it is what it is. I I, I really hope uh, that they they figure it out because the Rangers looked absolutely dominant. I'm giving them their credits. I'm giving them their props. Um, uh, but when it comes to the Devils, if they don't figure it out in this next game and they go down too well, I generally believe that this series is completely over. If they go to MSG, if they're nervous about playing at home, if they have to go to MSG and ha- and handle that crowd where it's going to be more Ranger fans than Devil fans, because for once it was actually more Devil fans than Ranger fans at a playoff game or a general Ranger Devils game, and they still couldn't figure it out. If they go to MSG, they have a rude awakening coming and uh you know i'm probably being a little bit too negative as the fan that i am that you guys know that i am uh but they just did not look ready and um and i just i just don't think they, they'll get past the rangers um they got to step it up a big time they got to take a, a lot of leaps if they want to compete in the series yeah i agree they definitely have to play a lot better than they did and i want to see timo meyer jesper bratt and jack hughes together because you need the, a talented line like that in order to consistently score goals and create offense, I think junkling the lines, get Yegor Sharangovich in there, get Bastion out. You know what? He only played, I think, like seven minutes anyway. Get someone who's going to actually be on the ice for you if you need a goal. Sharangovich is someone who can score, and he's got a wicked shot and a wicked release. You saw with Jack Hughes on the penalty shot, that can beat Igor. I just got to cut you off for one, yep. one thing. Just got to say one thing. To your point, in the playoff preview, you took the Devils in five, and the Devil, hey, you, you can't win a series in five unless you drop one, right, Ben? No, uh, hey, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. And look, while you guys I need think- a piece of humble pie. That's what you guys need, you stupid Ranger fans. You need a piece of humble pie. <laughs> But that is going to do it for us here on the Outsider Sports Hockey Podcast. We appreciate you tuning in, and we will have more coverage throughout the playoffs. Tom will not be with us next week. Enjoy yourself in Italy. We will figure things out, although it might be a little devil's bias. Make sure you check us out on social media, and make sure you tune in next week. We'll have another episode of the Outsider Sports Hockey Podcast.